Well, good morning, evangelists. Great to see you guys today. And isn't it a beautiful day in the neighborhood? I had to say that because somebody made a nice comment about my sweet sweater that my wife got me. So, hey, we are so glad that you are here with us at Evangel. And uh, it's just great to gather together as a church this morning. We want to give a, a warm welcome to those out there on Facebook. If you're tuning in, us, in with us there, we have folks monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions or just want to say hey, uh, please do so. We are going to open this morning with a verse out of Psalm chapter 84, verses 9 and 10, actually. That says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk, whose walk is blameless. Would you guys bow your heads and pray with me as we open this morning? Father, we come before you and you are good. And it is so true. Better is a day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. And God, we come into your presence this morning and we just ask that you would dwell amongst us, that you would be with us as we open your word together, as we worship you together. And God, that in that and through that, that you would uh, help us draw together in the unity of your son, Jesus Christ. He's the reason that we're here. He's the reason that we worship and he's the reason that we celebrate. It's in his precious, holy and mighty name that we pray. Amen. If you are able, would you please stand with us as we worship the Lord together this morning?
We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, we welcome in this place. Let every heart adore. Let every soul away. You guys can have a seat for a second while we go over announcements here real quick. So behind me on the screen, there is a QR code. If you guys want to grab out your smartphones, you can catch sermon notes on there and the lyrics to the songs. And you can keep those phones out because in just a minute here, the next slide, we're going to have another text number. It's 906-233-6611. That's kind of how we keep track of things going on here. If you are new, if you would just text new to that number. If you are a regular attender, if you would text here. That would be fantastic. And if there is an info change or if you have a prayer request at all, if you would text share to that number, uh, all those texts go to our pastoral staff here, and we will get back to you on that. Here at Evangel, we have opportunities to participate in the ministry here, and one of those opportunities is giving. And uh, Paul tells us that God loves a joyful giver, and we, when we give with joyful hearts, we are partnering with God in the ministry that he has called us to. So we have a few different ways that you can do that here at Evangel. Uh, you can keep your smartphone out there and you can text ECH Give to number 77977. We have some boxes in the back that you could drop your offering in back there. Or you can go to the website and uh, just click on the Give tab there and follow the instructions. We are starting a new sermon series next week called When Worlds Collide. And uh, we're going to look at, or when kingdoms collide, excuse me, uh, and we're going to look at what it looks like when we live in the kingdom of God of the here and now and how that collides with the world that we live in and uh, just how Jesus called us and brought this thing to life and what it means to really embrace the message that Jesus has for uh, the revolution of his kingdom colliding with our world. So be sure to join us and tune in next week with us as we jump into that new one. But we are going to wrap up our It's the End of the World as we know it, and we have hope series today. And Pastor Levi is going to lead us in the final uh, episode of that one today. So you guys are in for a treat. We have life groups here at Evangel, and that's one of our, our components of ministry here as a, a church of our size. Like, we really encourage you guys to get into some small groups where you can have community, you can dig into the word together, you can pray with one another, and you have people that are with you to do life together. And so we are having life group sign up for the rest of this month. The big push and final push will be next week, Sunday. So if you're not in a group yet and you would like to be or if you have questions about what that looks like, you can text groups to that 906-233-6611. And after we collect everybody's info next week, we will work on putting together groups for that. And if you have any questions, you can email me at travis at evangelup.org. Uh, believe it or not, Christmas is coming up probably sooner than we realize since we've got the, uh, the white stuff on the ground. It looks like Christmas, um, but we do Operation Christmas Child here at Evangel, and there's a quick video that we're going to show about that this morning. At the count of three, when children open the shoe boxes, they're so excited. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name, and that's what this is all about. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. The word of God is spreading. The gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. God will bless, and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you.
So if you haven't done a box for Operation Christmas Child before, it's a lot of fun. My kids love to do it. It, it really rings in the season. And we've got boxes out at the Welcome Center. You can grab those. The important date to note is that they need to be returned here by November 8th. And if you have any questions, you can email the office at office at evangelup.org. Uh, WANA clubs are starting up online this year, uh, Wednesday, October 21st. So the hope and the plan is to transition back to in-person gatherings at the first of the year. And to register, you can go to evangelup.org backslash Awana, and you can pick up the materials starting today at the Welcome Center uh, or at Monday, October 19th from 6 to 7 here at the church. And that's going to be a drive-by pickup, so it'll be right at the entrance. You don't even have to get out of your car or anything like that, so it's going to be super convenient. And if you have any questions, you can email nate at evangelup.org. We have a slight change in the schedule. We've got our family mi business meeting coming up. Uh, it's slated for November 1st. That's a date change at 6 p.m. here at the church. Uh, if you want to learn about what's going on, that's where you can come and find out. If you are a regular member, we uh, really uh, ask you to be at that meeting with us. And if you have any questions, again, you can email or call the church. We have lots of ways to stay connected here at Evangel. Uh, we have all the social media platforms. We have emails. We have the text number. And you can still use your good old-fashioned phone and give us a call. I'm going to turn it back over to the worship team. Please rise if you're able. Let's lift our voices to the Lord.
Kids, you can go to the live studio to audience, which is off to my left, if you would like to go over there. Well, this is our last installment of uh, It's the End of the World as We Know It, and I Have Hope. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Revelations chapter 21. Uh, just a real quick push for small groups. Um, you know, we talk about small groups. Small groups aren't a program for us here. It's a part of the philosophy of what we're actually doing. Um, the sermon, we say this often, the sermon is not the point. The sermon is the push toward transformation. All of our small groups are designed for you to go in and to dig a little bit deeper, to ask some of those questions that we're asking in here, to wrestle with some of what God has to say for us um, as a community. And we really believe as God's people open the word of God together, that change happens. 
That's where the change agent is, is, is the Spirit is allowed to speak into our lives and to move us and to change us. So if you're not a part of a small group, we really just encourage you to do that. Um, it's a part of uh, what we will tell you uh, is really good for you to be in community that way, to be opening the Word of God together. Before we get started uh, with our, our gathering of opening the Word of God together, let's just pray. Father, we come. Thank you for this time that we have just to be together to open your word. We ask that you would bless it, that your spirit would be able to move, that we would, we would see just a piece of your goodness. God, to think that you're running after us, that we didn't run towards you, but you ran after us. We're, we're thankful for that. We're thankful for your son, Jesus, who, who gave it all for us. And so we just want to lift his name up today. We hope we do that well, that it pleases you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's the end of the world as we know it. And I have hope. This has been a kind of a short survey of the book of Revelation. There's a lot more in here that you can read on your own. We just continue to encourage you uh, to, to read through this. The Bible says that those who read, those who hear, uh, you will be blessed uh, for the reading and the understanding of this book. And uh, so we want to just kind of walk through this last time together. And this book, as you remember, it, the book is designed to give the church hope. The book is about Jesus. It starts with Jesus, and it will end with Jesus. And, and so what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at kind of those last two chapters of Revelation. If you have not read this or you don't know this, I'm about to give you a spoiler alert. Um, the end of the world happens, and guess who wins? Um, plug your ears if you don't want to know if you're still reading through this. It's Jesus. Um, Jesus wins in this thing, and Jesus will reign. Jesus will be the King of Kings. He will be the Lord of Lords, and every nation, every tongue, every person will bow down to Him. And uh, this is what the Scripture indicates to us. And we will be with Him forever and ever and ever. And it's going to be awesome. And it's going to be incredible. Um, but Jesus wins, and that's what we're going to be looking at just a little bit uh, of that today. The Bible starts off with uh, the book of Genesis, the beginning. And it, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and so we have this idea of creation. God created how he did that. We're not here to argue that today, but um, I, I don't know how he did it, but he did it with the words of his mouth and the very power of his mouth is what the scripture say, that he, he spoke it into existence. So God created the heavens and the earth. That's how the Bible starts. The Bible ends with something just a little bit different. The last verse says, uh, come Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus. Be people. Amen. So you have in the scriptures, you have creation, you have fall, you have redemption, and you have consummation. Those are kind of the major parts of Scripture. So we get the idea that God created. We get the idea, hopefully, that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that there's been a fall, that we've walked away from God, that we are rebels to Him. Uh, we have redemption. Well, how does redemption work? How does redemption work? In the Old Testament, God gives His people, His chosen people, He gives them the law. And the law was given for God's moral precepts. It was how you were to live as a human. And they were to follow the law by faith. And so what the purpose of the law was, um, was to give some of the rules. This is how you're supposed to live. This is how I want you to operate. This is how I want you to live so that you will bless other nations. That was the commitment to God's people back then that they were supposed to do that. There is a secondary purpose, though, to the law, and the secondary purpose to the law was to make us aware of sin and our inability to be righteous. If you look at Romans 3.20, it says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. These are the rules. These are the moral precepts. Um, rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. We become aware of our sinful nature, that we can't live up to this, that we can't earn our way to God. And so it goes on, um, our, our Old Testament Jewish cousins, um, they, they worked out and worked on this concept of living out the law in their lives, adhering to the law. Um, but did they believe, this is a question, did they believe that this was enough to provide righteousness for them? And the simple answer to that is no, they didn't believe that. 
They didn't believe that that was going to provide righteousness for them, that that would earn their way to God. Um, they actually believed that there was a Messiah, there was an anointed one, there was one coming. Uh, he was a chosen one, and they believed in that by faith. Um, but the law wasn't designed to pardon their sins. And they understood that. They did not believe that it was going to pardon their sins um, and, and earn their way back to God by following the law. They just believed that, hey, this is the very, this, God told us to do it, so we're going to do it, right? We're going to live this out. What they understood was the sacrifice of animals and uh, the day of atonement, the day of reckoning, the day of redemption, the day of redeeming um, that, that their sins would be, be covered, Yom Kippur. Uh, this is the day the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would spread the blood of the animal there. And uh, it was an offering for the sins of the people. If the people could earn their way back to heaven in the Old Testament by following the law, they would have done that. But they knew and they understood that there had to be a sacrifice. There had to be something more than that. They understood there needed to be a sacrifice for that to happen. Uh, Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves, to cover your sins. For on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. And so there had to be blood that was shed. Um, in Hebrews, it talks about this. It says, when Christ came as the high priest, notice this idea of high priest. This is the guy who goes into the Holy of Holies. He, he speaks for the people. He's the one who, who atones for the sins of the people in the Old Testament. So Jesus becomes our high priest. When he came as the high priest, of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not a part of this creation. And so there's a different type of thing that Jesus was going through. He was going through a different type of tabernacle, uh, an eternal tabernacle. Next slide. He did not enter by means of of the blood of goats and calves. This is, this is how the high priest in the Old Testament did. They would go through um, and into the Holy of Holies through the shedding of blood of the animals, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. And so Jesus becomes the Lamb of God, or he is the Lamb of God. He doesn't become it. He is the Lamb of God. Um, in fact, the law requires... This is the, in Hebrews 9.22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with the blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so it's not just following, it's not earning our way back to, um, in, in John 1.17, it says, for the law was given through Moses. So for Jewish people at this point, Moses is the greatest character of the scripture because the law was given to them. This is how you're supposed to live. Um, but Jesus comes, and he comes with grace and truth, and he came, and that came through him, and what did that tell us? That we are men and women that are in need of a Savior, that we need redemption, that we need uh, the Lamb of God, we need his blood to cover our sins. The laws, the rules were given through Moses, but Jesus taught you are a people who are in need of a Savior, and he gives his life for you and I. He gave us grace and truth. He said, you're sinners, repent for the kingdom of God is near. And so there is this truth, but there's also this grace. He gave us a way out of it. Christianity is not a religion of, hey, how do we earn our way to heaven? How do we be, how can we be good enough to earn our way to heaven? It's a movement of people who accept what has already been done for us by God through the person of Jesus Christ. You can't earn your way to God. It's all about Jesus and what he did for you and me. We accept his sacrifice for the atonement, for the covering of our sins, to give us righteousness. When we accept his sacrifice, we're given, um, we're given this righteousness that allows us to enter in to heaven, allows us to live eternally with God. Um, I don't want to try to get my atonement and we've talked through this in this series, I don't want to get, try to get my atonement through my behavior, right? We don't get our, our atonement through our behavior, we get it through our Savior, right? So when we get to heaven, 
and uh, I, I, I don't, uh, uh, the final judgment, God will not be looking at me with eyes of evaluation of my behavior, but he's going to be looking at the transformation that has taken pl- place because of my Savior, who is Jesus. To understand that is super important for where we're going today. So you need to understand the blood sacrifice system. You need to understand what this means, how righteousness is given to us through the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible actually, how it works is there's a beginning, there's a middle, and then there's a new beginning. The end is actually the new beginning, right? It's a new beginning that we're, we're walking into. And that's what we're going to be looking at today is this new beginning. So the end of Scripture is just the beginning. It's a new beginning. The Bible tells us that Jesus will make all things new. He's going to win and he's going to wipe out all evil for all time. Jesus is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords and he has that power to do that. When Jesus came to earth the first time, he came as a little baby and uh, he came in a manger. But on the second time, we've talked about this, he's not coming like that, is he? He's not coming as, you know, 8.6 ounce little baby in a manger. That's not how he's coming. He's coming as warrior. He's coming. And, and uh, he's going to be riding a horse and, and faithful and true, and there's going to be armies behind him. Do you remember this? And what are these armies going to be dressed in? Are they going to be in army green? No, they're going to be in white. Why are they going to be in white? Because they ain't getting dirty, Right? Jesus is going to come down, and he's going to throw down, and and it's going to be all over, because he's Jesus. It's going to be from the very words of his mouth that this is going to to change things. We're not going to even get dirty. And Jesus is going to come down, he's going to, to make all things new. The book of Revelation is a book of hope. It's a hope because Jesus is going to win. Jesus is good and he's gracious and and he's going to defeat all evil. If you are a follower of Jesus, this book is a book of hope. Let's look at what the scriptures tell us in chapter 21. It says this, Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth was passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. And this chapter talks about heaven. It's interesting right from the very beginning of it, it, it you take a look at it we, we we don't actually reside think about this we don't actually reside in heaven forever and for some of you that's going to blow your mind what what's going on no there's a, there's a new heaven and a new earth what are you created to be you were created to be human you were created to be physical you were created to have a body and god's going to make all things new and that what's going to happen is, is that that god is going to come down and he is going to dwell with his people he's going to come out of heaven um, to land here on earth sometimes when the bible talks about heaven it talks about this new heaven and new earth it doesn't mean that there's going to be like a new heaven where god dwells and there's going to be angels and things really what that's talking about is atmosphere um and there's going to be a new atmosphere and there's going to be something and i'll explain this in just a moment um, there's going to be a new physical world in which we live in and dwell in. The, the great thing about this, if you jump down to verse 3, where God is dwell, his dwelling place is, his dwelling place is with his people. See, 
we look at, and if you read this whole chapter, it's going to talk about pearly gates. There's a lot of bling in heaven. Pearly gates, golden streets, mansions, awesome things, right? And you go, wow, heaven's awesome. Heaven isn't awesome because of pearly gates and gold streets. Gold, it means that the gold, uh, there's no value to it. That's why they put it on the ground, right? It's not valuable at that point. The value of heaven and the value uh, of heaven always is that God is there and we're with him. That's what it makes it heaven. And so when he comes down and he dwells with his people, this is kind of the last thing. This is the completion of, and he's going to dwell with his people. And it's going to be awesome. And the reason it's going to be awesome, it's not because of all the bling that's going to be there. It's because God is there. And he dwells with his people. See, God created the heaven and earth. And all the way back in Genesis, right at the beginning, if you read the early account of man, of Adam and Eve, and they're walking and they're talking and they're meeting and they're dwelling with God. And it's amazing and it's awesome. And then they choose to rebel against what God told them to do. And all hell breaks loose. And sin and, and death and destruction comes into the world. Well, that's going to be no more when God is dwelling with us. And this whole time, so you have the beginning, you have creation, you have fall, and then you have the middle. It's this working toward redemption. It's working toward redeeming. It's working toward this new earth, this new creation, where God is dwelling with his people, where God is connected to his people in, the, in, in a better way than he was even in the first part. But that, that's the connection part. Whether you realize this or not, the deepest longing of your soul and my soul is to be connected to God in this way, that he dwell with us. You and I are created to be with God. And so we're created this way, and it's going to be this way. The city comes down out of heaven in the book, and uh, we're not going to read this part, but it's really interesting. It's like 14 or 1500 miles wide, long, and high. It's pretty big, right? So, like, think from here to Orlando, Florida, that would be kind of 1500 ish miles from us. Pretty crazy, right? Pretty big, and then it goes all the way west, but then it goes high. Uh, and, and so it goes 1,500 miles high. I don't exactly know how that works. It seems like that would be out of the atmosphere, but there's a new heaven and then there's a new earth and there's new rules, right? And, and so if you think about that, if you take our world and you take each floor being 12 feet and it's 1,500 miles high, so your math people can kind of figure that out, um, it's 600 thousand floors will be in heaven um so that's what that's what the new new jerusalem the new city will be like six hundred thousand floors that'll be a lot to discover and a lot to have fun with right for for that um we don't exactly know how it's going to look we do know a few things about heaven though we or about to this new jerusalem that there won't be lights there because the glory of god will be there and it will light the whole city that's a pretty big light right pretty big light that can light that that big huge cube up verse 4 it says it will wipe every tear from their eyes there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away this the, the, this old order of the world groaning the world the world in destruction the world in decay it's not going to happen anymore uh, your car is not going to rust anymore. Uh, it's not going to be like that, right? What this passage says is that death will be dead. Death will be dead. It won't be anymore. This past week, I got an email saying that one of our friends, um, Richard Bazat, uh, passed away. I hate those emails. I hate those phone calls. Uh, I hate that, that. Even though well, Richard just went to sleep. Um, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I still don't like it. I, I'm, I can't wait to have it. Never, ever will I get another one of those phone calls. Never, ever will you ever go, oh, you know, 
Jim Bob down at the market, he died. No, nope. you'll never, ever, 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 ever get that. And it'll be wonderful. There's not going to be pain. The old thing has passed away. He was seated on the throne and said, I am making everything new. And then he says, write these words down. They're trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Doesn't mean that he's in a frat house. That's the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. It'd be like, I am the A and the Z. I'm the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give you water without cost from the spring of the water of life. So what does this mean? It is done. That means full redemption. Fully done, fully complete. God's plan all done, executed. Jesus says, I'm the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of water of life. For those who thirst after God, he will give the privilege of freely, freely drinking from the water of life. Their innermost thirst, our innermost thirst will be satisfied. This connection to God will be satisfied. And we will wake up every day going, man, this is a good day. This is a good day because God's there. And we're connected to him. For those of you listening on Facebook and for, or watching on Facebook and listening here, um, have you ever sat and went, there's got to be something more to this world. Got to be something more. You're sitting there and you're thinking and you're like, it can't just be me. There's got to be something greater. There's got to be more to life. I'm missing something here. And we chase this and we chase that and we think, well, maybe that's it or maybe this is it. We have a thirst for this. It's in our innermost soul that we would, we would be able to be with God in this way. The ultimate satisfaction is God with his people in this way. People will talk, and maybe you've heard a Christian, and, and you're, you're still trying to figure this thing out, and you're still checking out Christianity. We're so glad that you're watching or you're here with us. Um, you'll hear people say, well, Jesus satisfies my soul. This is what they're talking about. It's like this in this moment when, when we're able to drink and, and be satisfied. It, it's like, think about Thanksgiving right after you've eaten and you're about to watch a football game and you fall asleep. It, you're so satisfied. Life is good. That's how this is going to be, but 10 times better, 100 times better, 1,000 times. It's going to be amazing. This is what the picture the Bible gives us. Every human being on the planet Earth has thought the thought, there has to be more. Why have we thought that? You know, if we just came from like pre-mortal soup, you know, and bloop, we popped up and we were, we're, we're hanging out, I don't think we'd have the bandwidth for that. Why would we have the bandwidth for that? Like, why would you even think that? Um, you know, if there was no creator God, it just happened to each other, why would we have this deep, unsatisfied part of our hearts? Here's the answer. Because there's something more. <laughs> and it's called Jesus. It's called God. And he wants to know you. He wants to be in relationship with you. And he loves you and he runs after you with his goodness. There's something more. Revelation chapter 22. Um, we're going to jump over there. And there's a ton of stuff in 21 that we could talk about. Jesus says, look, I'm coming soon. Behold, I'm coming soon. Um, when is Jesus coming? Nobody knows. And if somebody says they do know they're trying to sell you something, don't buy it. Right? Well, well then what does it mean that he's coming soon? Uh, the Greek word here is taku. Um, and... Uh, it, it is it kind of sounds Star Wars y, doesn't it? Taku. Um, and, and so it, it's this, this word that we get in the English language where we get tachometer. Um, it's that, that's our word we get out of that. It's a, it's a root word of that. And so think about a tachometer, how it, it works. It's, you know, you, you put your car in park or whatever and, and you push on the gas and you see the, the tachometer go. Vroom, vroom. It's measuring the 
the energy that the, the engine is producing. And, and, and so, is going like that. And so, think about it in this way. When it says he's coming soon, it, you know, we, we know that, that time is a little bit different for God than for us. But what we do know is the scriptures tell us that the earth is groaning or longing for this moment when Jesus comes back and everything is made right. And when he comes back, it's, it, it, it's, it says it's longing, it's groaning, it's revving up for this moment. The earth is going, like, come back, Jesus. And every day, guess what happens? We get one day closer. We get one day closer to that, that day, that wonderful day where he comes back. He says, my reward is, um, is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. He says, I, again, I'm the, the first and I'm the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. He's talking about eternal life here. And, and what he's talking about is this tree of life. He's talking about this gift. And they can come into the city. Remember this huge, you know, big, huge city, 1,500 miles this way, 1,500 miles this way, 1,500 miles up high. And, and it says that the, blessed are those who wash their robes. What is he talking about there? You got to have a clean robe? Like, what, what does this mean? How does this work? You can't have a dirty robe. I'll tell you that. Um, and, and what it means is it's going all the way back to Revelations chapter 7, and he's comparing something here. And, and, uh, he, and he said, these are, the, these are they who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now go back to the sacrificial system that we talked about at the very beginning. In the Old Testament, they had to sacrifice a lamb. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. One sacrifice, and, and he covers our sin. He, he clothes us with, with his righteousness. And, and, and so this blood that was shed is for us. So when he's talking about the washing of your robe, it's, it, it's those who have chose to wash, to wash their robe in the blood of the Lamb. Those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they're rewarded with something. They're rewarded with the tree of life and permission to get into the gates of the holy city. This robe isn't something that you and I can do. We can't do it for ourselves. We can't earn it. We can't wash it clean enough on our own. We can't do it. You have to be perfect. Anybody know anybody who's perfect? Yeah. Probably, you know people who think they're perfect and they're super annoying, right? But you probably don't know anybody that actually is perfect other than Jesus, right? Heaven is not about getting your, yourself there, but it's about receiving this gift. It's about trusting in the blood of the Lamb. It's about trusting in who Jesus is. It's about clothing ourselves with this sweet robe that Jesus gives us and only Jesus can give us. It's not going to go down like this, but just pretend for just a moment we get to heaven and St. Peter's there. You've heard this before, this joke, right? It's not a joke, though. Um, he asks the question, Levi, why should I let you in? This is not going to be my answer. Well, I'm a pastor. I give to charity. I voted in every election. I'm a good citizen, and I've only had two speeding tickets. Well, maybe three. Um, two of them I deserved. Um, I, I'm not going with that as my answer. I'll tell you that. I'm going to look at my robe, right? Look at my robe. Look at it. It's awesome. Because who it is, whose is it? It's Jesus' robe. It's his righteousness clothing me. And I'm go. I'm with him. That's why you let me in, Pete. Get out of the way. And I'm walking in, right? It's because of Jesus. It's not be my behavior. Uh-uh. 
my Savior? Oh, yeah, because he gave me a sweet robe. And if you've put your trust in Jesus, he gave you that robe too. You've washed, you've washed in the blood of the Lamb. Story of hope, folks. This book is a story of hope for the church. You're going to get to walk into those gates. The new heaven and new earth. This huge city where God dwells with his people. How awesome is that going to be? Pretty awesome, right? Verse 15. There's a sobering moment here. For those of you who, who try to wash your own robe, who say, I don't believe in Jesus, there's a sobering moment in verse 15. And this is what it says. Outside are the dogs. This is not canines. These are people who have mocked the truth of Jesus. Those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. You might go, well, I never mocked Jesus. I haven't been sexually immoral. I've never killed anybody. I don't worship little graven images or practice falsehood. So I should get in. Here's what the Bible says. If you've trusted anything other than Jesus for the outcome, um, you probably have touched on magic arts, superstitions at some level. If you've lusted after anybody other than your spouse, the scriptures say that you're in the sexual immoral, immoral camp. The Bible says that if you lust in your heart is akin to adultery. You ever said, man, I don't like that. I hate that person. Guess what, you murderer? That's what the Bible says. It's akin to it. You ever told a lie, a falsehood? Mm hmm Yeah. Right? And you go, well, everyone's done that. Yeah, duh, that's what the Bible says. <laughs> You've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Me too. Me too. And you need to be washed. You need to be washed by the blood of the Lamb. You need to be washed, and he needs to give you this robe that's awesome. The very longing of our hearts is to be with God. It's in every person. The good news is that Jesus Christ came and he gave his life for you and me. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That he came and he told us the truth. You're sinners. You're rebellious. You're in rebellion to God. But guess what? I can bring you into relationship with him. I can do it through who I am. And, and then he goes to the cross and he dies for you and me and his blood was shed one sacrifice for all time for all sin amazing right we don't get to earn our salvation because we can't earn our salvation we get to receive our salvation if you are trusting in your behavior for your salvation you will lose you don't trust in your behavior you trust in your savior right For those of you who have received Jesus, this is a book of hope. It's so wonderful. It's so amazing. I hope you've been blessed by hearing the words that are written in this book because God promised that, number one. And number two, it's just awesome, right? Like, it's going to be an incredible time when King Jesus comes back. It's going to be awesome. I, hope, I also hope it compels you to get out of the seats and to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. If you truly believe this, there are people who are trusting in their behavior to earn their salvation, and that is not okay because, guess what? Their name is not written in the book of life. It's in books. And if you're judged by the books, it's not good. We learned this a few weeks ago. You need to be in the book. And if you're in the book, you get the robe. And it's awesome. And you get to dwell with God forever and ever. You have friends. You have family members. You have neighbors. And you should be compelled to tell them the good news of Jesus Christ without apology. Because eternity matters. For some of you, you're hearing this and going, holy smokes, I've been trusted in my behavior. I hope you trust in Jesus. I've told you the gospel throughout this thing um, over and over and over again. You trust in Jesus. We trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. Uh, we trust in the blood that was shed. We trust that he is the Lamb of God, that he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. That's what we place our, 
our faith in. That's what we place our hope in. That's what we trust in, that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus. And I hope you do that. I truly. You've heard the gospel. It's your choice to respond or not to respond, though. God's longing is that you would respond. That The scriptures, I love the Father's heart. The Father's heart is that no one would perish, but all would come to faith, that they would repent and come to faith. That's what he wants. He wants that for you. He wants that for me because he absolutely loves you. Here's what the church cries and has been crying for every generation. It's the end of the world as we know it. But we have hope. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We recognize that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. God, we're just thankful that you chose to do that for us, that you chose us to show us grace and you chose to show us mercy uh, when we were rebels against you. There is no greater love that a man laid down his life for his friends and Jesus did that for us. While we were enemies, Christ died for us. God, I can't imagine the sacrifice that was, the pain that you went through for that, but man, I'm so thankful for that. God, we're thankful that we can come boldly before your throne because of what Jesus did, our high priest. We're thankful that someday he is coming back and he will have a tattoo that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we celebrate that. God, we recognize that we are not on the planning committee for that day, but we are on the welcoming committee. God, let us, let us be prepared for Jesus to come. Let us be anticipating that Jesus comes. Let us be crying out, oh Lord Jesus, come, come soon. And let us live in light of what you've done and given to us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Please raise if you're able.
All glory be to King Jesus because he he's able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious presence blameless with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore and all God's people said